Welcome to the Fast Leader Podcast, where we uncover the leadership life hacks that help you to experience breakout performance faster and rocket to success. And now, here's your host, customer and employee engagement expert, and certified emotional intelligent practitioner, Jim Rimbach. Call Center Coach develops and unites the next generation of call center leaders. Through our e-learning and community, individuals gain knowledge and skills in the six core competencies that is the blueprint that develops high-performing call center leaders. Successful supervisors do not just happen. So go to callcentercoach.com to learn more about enrollment and download your copy of the Supervisor Success Path eBook now. Okay, Fast Leader Legion, today I'm excited because I have somebody on the show today who's going to help us to improve our value proposition dramatically increase sales, revenue, and profits without spending more money, hiring more people, or working more hours. And if those things are of interest to you, you absolutely want to listen and watch this entire episode and share it with your colleagues because I have Kent Billingsley on the show with me today. And Kent Billingsley grew up in Evansville, Indiana with three siblings, an older sister who was an English professor at a college in Florida and two older brothers. He grew up in a wonderful family. The only challenge was with four kids, his father's salary being a school administrator didn't stretch. The family had all the basics. However, there was little money for fun with four kids. Necessity became the mother of invention. He didn't know what it was called at the time, but learning how to earn triggered Kent's entrepreneurial spirit. Being an entrepreneur, being an entrepreneur starting at the age, early age, of 11 years old, it taught he was able to actually teach drum lessons to six students and had a lawn mowing business and log splitting service. In addition, he ran a lemonade stand on Saturdays and Sunday afternoons right next to the golf course for several months. He made so much money that it was shut down twice by city officials because he didn't have a permit and the golf course owners complained because he was stealing their bar sales. Because of his entrepreneurial success as a youngster, he decided to go to business school instead of architectural school, and he graduated from Indiana University in 1982. His career has involved brands like Pepsi, Frito-Lay, EDS, and Micromuse, where he applied his years of business optimization in his business unit to take it from $2 million to about $38 million in two and a half years. He's retired twice, once in his 30s and then again in his 40s, and has now helped transform thousands of organizations, entrepreneurial organizations, corporations, profits, nonprofits, religious organizations, local, state, and federal agencies. Kent is actually the author as well of Entrepreneur to Millionaire, How to Build a Highly Profitable Fast Growth Company and Become Embarrassingly Rich Doing It. It has a four-phase sequentially principled recipe for creating wealth inside a business and, not, and, and to not lift a finger doing it. Mark Cuban read his manuscript and liked it so much that he wrote a one and a half page forward saying, this is a must read book. I wish I would have had it when I started. Kent Billingsley is known as America's revenue growth architect and is an international keynote speaker, published author, and business transformation expert, having delivered over 10,000 hours of content all over the world. He lives in a suburb outside of Dallas, Texas called Capello, Capel. And he is married to Terry and has a son in Scouts, along with two cats, a dog, and a gecko. His family hobbies are air tent family glamping, which is luxury inflatable tents from Europe. Kent Billingsley, are you ready to help us get over the hump? I'm so ready. What a, what a great introduction. Thank you so much. Well, you know, I've, you and I have had a great discussion already off mark, and I'm looking forward to actually us pulling this, uh, oh gosh, this wealth of information that you have to share on. Uh, to the recording so everybody else can listen to it. So before we get into all that discussion, if you could help us understand how what you're going to share with us today is going to impact the customer experience. Yeah, the uh, the whole focus of this book is not about wealth. It's not about money. It's It's about really money being the byproduct or being in parallel with delivering extreme value to your clients, to your stakeholders, to your employees, to the community. And so, um, uh, although that's the title is kind of focuses on money, it's really centered around, are are you solving problems in the marketplace? That's a a whole chapter on uh, why should you even exist and where do you bring value and is your value proposition unique? And so, it's interesting when I work with clients, my first questions are all about 
uh, the marketplace, your, your, uh, who you're selling to and marketing to, uh, and they want to tell me all about their company, I'm, I'm saying, I don't care yet. Look, tell me about who you're trying to satisfy and who you're trying to solve, and, and who are you trying to help create wealth inside their business? And so that's really the focus, and, and maybe someday I can write two or three books just on that topic. Um, where I found the problem for most uh, business owners and entrepreneurs and companies all over the world is they're actually pretty good at that. They, they offer great products and services and they deliver tremendous value propositions. They're just terrible at turning it into money. They're, they're terrible at understanding how do you convert um, the, the, our products and services into the most uh, profits and cash and sales possible. So they end up, and this is really an interesting phenomenon, most companies end up trading their products and services in time for dollars with the lowest margins in a transactional basis, even though they think it's relationship oriented, it's a transactional basis. And they never understand how to leverage the true worth or strategic value of the impact their products and services bring to the market. And that's really how I, I, um, I had that conversation with Mark Cuban 15 years ago. And he goes, Ken, I agree. And I said, Mark, I'm, I've got a few case studies as I get more and more case studies. I'm going to write a book on this topic and this subject. And, and he looked at me and he said, when you write that book, I'll read it. And if I like it, I'll write the foreword for it. And that's what he did. And that's what he did. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and, you know, we, we throw, and I think you bring up a really good point because we throw around the world, the word entrepreneur in a lot of different contexts and a lot of different ways. And, you know, some people may think, hey, that's the rebel and the nomad and the, you know, the creative innovator. And, you know, it's that person, but that's not what you're saying in this book. You actually have a, definition that you clarify at the back of the book about what is an entrepreneur. But I think it's important that we discuss that right now in order to set the stage for the rest of the conversation. So Kent, what is an entrepreneur? Yeah. And that was a question that uh, originally when I was working on the book for the last, what, 18 years and um, then writing it uh, voraciously for the last three um, was as I kept researching and saying, well, what is an entrepreneur? What's the definition of an entrepreneur? Uh, my last blog was what, what makes an entrepreneur successful? It's not what you're told or sold. And, and so one of the big ahas that I discovered is I, I look back through the 10,000 hours of delivery and, and thousands of client session notes I take in every session. Uh, what I started to discover was entrepreneur is really kind of a title or a role or maybe a tag. Um, but it never defined those people in our programs that were phenomenally successful. And it really separated out the people call themselves this title. They, they give themselves this title, this young risk taker, this uh, tech entrepreneur, this, you know, we, we, we have kind of this definition. And, and I'm saying, well, first of all, that's a title or a role. But the real behavior is what separates out the successful ones. And it's being entrepreneurial. And, and what I mean by that, and I describe a few examples, and this might be my next book, is understanding and explaining the difference between an entrepreneur being versus being entrepreneurial. And, and my point there that, that I need people to know, and I'll, I want your listeners to understand, because you have to be entrepreneurial today. I don't care what you call yourself, and I don't care what your role is in a company, you've got to be entrepreneurial today. And, and so... It's easy to say an entrepreneur is a risk taker or a problem solver. Well, they are, but you have to understand that they're a, a creative problem solver. Every, we, everybody solves problems all day long. My wife solves problems. I watch my 11-year-old solve problems. But it's a creative problem solver. And an example of that in the premise of the whole book is, well, how do I solve complex business problems without spending money and without adding bodies? Now, you'll never get a, a job in the government thinking like that, but... <laughs> But in private business, you have to understand how to do that. And that's how you'll rise to the top. And, and that's how you're going to have a very long career, even in tough times, because you know how to solve problems without spending money, without burning through people, without uh, grinding yourself out or, or abusing your own health. And, and so uh, there, what I discovered in my process, analyzing thousands of people been through our programs, what was it that made certain ones so successful? They, they generate millions of dollars so much faster and, and put some of that money in their pockets for themselves and their employees. It's because they were truly entrepreneurial. Uh, and, and another example of that is not just creative problem solvers, but uh, they took calculated risks. 
There's this old, you hear these, I take all these risks. You got to be a risk taker and learn how to fail and all that stuff. I can't wait till my son comes to me and goes, dad, I'm going to be an entrepreneur because I'm learning how to fail in school. I, I'm going to lose it. Um, I, I don't know where this stuff comes from. You've got to be a, a calculated a risk taker and understanding well, what are the risks? What's the scope of the risk? How do I mitigate the risk? What are risk prevention strategies? You, you have to understand things in a 360 degrees versus just throwing these flippant terms out there like, well, you got to be passionate. You got to be persistent. Uh, it's all about personality. It's all about just learning how to fail. No, uh, you, you actually have to be a creative problem solver. Um, uh, take calculated risk. Another big one that I discovered that was interesting, and I, 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 I live this with the book coming out, is you've got to be a thirsty learner. Not somebody that reads or take notes or goes to seminars. There's, everybody does that. They're on Zoom seminars all day now. No, a thirsty learner is somebody that's trying to absorb concepts. They're trying to gain insights, not learn facts and figures. And, and it was interesting, like with this book, when the manuscript was in a certain condition, I sent it out to about 25, 30 uh, clients, friends, associates, people I work with in different uh, organizations. But I only sent them half the book because I didn't want the whole book floating on the internet. And it was interesting, about four or five of them came right back to me within 24, 48 hours ago. Where's the other half? I've got to read the other half. Uh, here's all the notes I've taken. I've highlighted all these concepts. Uh, there's so much good here. Where's the other half? And those four to five people, are the same ones that are running really successful businesses right now. And, and the others are having running good businesses and they're good business people. And I, and I love them to death as friends and clients, but they're not the ones optimizing their businesses right now. They're not the ones creating the most wealth because they're not the thirsty learners. And that was, so that was another on, uh, attribute of, of being truly entrepreneurial versus just calling themselves an entrepreneur. And uh, I, I probably identified, oh, I'm trying to remember 12, 15, maybe 20 uh, different kinds of attributes, not, not the traits like characteristics and personality and, and all those kinds of high drive and motor and discipline. I mean, a lot of small business owners have all those things. But being an entrepreneur, and I, I want to go back uh, or real quick, I want to touch on another point we met, you may ask me about, it, but somebody was asking me the other day about problem solving. And I said, yeah, a, a small business owner looks at a problem and sees a company doing it and says, you know what, I can do that too. An entrepreneur looks at the problem and, and looks around at everybody doing it and says, I can do that differently. And, and to me, that, that's that big aha moment of what really separates somebody out is how they see the world. Are they aspirational? Are they, are they starting running and growing a business? Or are they on a mission? And, and, and those are the kind of things that, that as whether you're a leader or you're an employee, you have to think entrepreneurial today because we are all in this together. And that's what's going to separate the winners and the losers. Okay, as you say that, I start thinking about my own career working within an organization yeah. and had, although probably didn't have the good buffer um, when it came to, hey, I can do that better or we can do that better. And I would just say, hey, you know, this is what, you know, I see can happen and needs to happen. And it just ruffled way too many feathers. Right. And yeah. so, I mean, I found myself being in an organization that didn't want that. And so, I mean, for, for me, what is it that I needed to conform or I needed to find other organizations faster? I mean, what, which, which was it? It, it? It's so interesting. And as I uh, talk to a lot of people today, they're reading my book, they're following my book, and especially salespeople. I tell them, you want to work for a company that believes in these philosophies. You want to be associated in a culture that believes in this philosophy of setting everyone up for success. You want to work for leaders that understand it's not about more for less grinding people out and abusing relationships and doing whatever it takes to make a number. You don't want to be in those kinds of companies. So, so if, you, if you're following what I'm, what I'm sharing in the book and this roadmap, if you're following that and you're a cultural misfit in your company, you, you may either have a talk with them or walk away. Be, because they're, they're just not on the right, they're not on that sustainable path of delivering the greatest level of value to the marketplace, making the world a better place and helping everybody share in the wealth doing it. And that, that's, to me, that's the only kind of company uh, you want to work for today. Well, and what you're talking about is identifying a company that is, has the characteristics for business growth. And you talk about that the, the model of business growth today is flawed. So why, why is it flawed and how is, is the model today flawed? 
Yeah, when I actually started this, and I want to go back because it ties these two pieces together. I was in a, working in a large corporation. I was doing uh, some sales uh, methodology implementation, Salesforce optimization. I, I can use the big words because I was in a big company, right? And um, it was interesting. They came to me and they said, hey, this is great what you're doing, but we want you to form a team and go back and, and look at the whole enterprise to see are there ways to optimize and, and bring this all together and, and be more successful. And so I formed a team and I went back into business units. They were averaged about a billion dollars in size, thousands of employees. What I uncovered and discovered through working with several of those organizations was there was this mantra or core strategy around growth. And it was bigger, business growth. How, how do we, if we're a billion, how do we get to a billion five? Or if we're 800 million, how do we get to 1.6 billion? It was, it was this whole bigger thing, which was the goal. And in a public company, you know, you, you got to hit your revenue and profit numbers. I get that. Um, where the flaw was, and this was 1995, where the flaw was and what they wanted me to uncover or help figure out was the whole philosophy was more for more. So to get more, to grow bigger, to grow faster, to grow more revenue, we, we've got to hire more, uh, we've got to work more, we've got to add more products, uh, we've got to add more employees, we've got to do more marketing, uh, we've got to do more training, we've got to add more management. And, and, and so to get more, we had to add more. Now, here's the flaw. And that was 25 years ago when it was flawed, and it's even worse today. When you add a lot of good things. When you add uh, more revenue top line, when you add uh, maybe more profit, uh, you add a lot of bad things. You add more infrastructure, you add more employees. You add, and I don't mean employees are bad. What I mean is when you're adding them and you're creating bureaucracy, when you're at it, having to add so many that you're adding more layers of management, you're eating away at your cost. Um, when, you're, uh, when you're adding more contracts and clients, you're adding more infrastructure, more support, more uh, locations, more. Now, those it, what's interesting, I remember many people telling me, well, Kent, that's the cost of doing business. You just need to understand that. And I said, well, I can't tell you how many times when somebody would tell me you just need to understand that is when I thought, maybe I don't. Maybe there is a different way. Maybe there is a better way. And so I worked with those organizations and we uncovered and discovered there were ways to generate a lot more of the good things without adding the bad things. And this is what I call revenue growth. And this is where you're scaling revenue against an asset. And what I mean by that is, is that, so if, if a company has a client to, to generate more business, they go get another client and then they go get another client. And what I'm saying is, well, have you maxed out your relationship and penetration with that client? Has that client bought everything you had and are they under an agreement or contract forever? Or do they stay with you forever? If not, why not? Because it's going to cost you and everybody, you know, the numbers eight to 10 times to go get that next client. And then you lose one out the back door while you're chasing one in the front door. And, and I just go, why? And, and, and even my business, I, it, and I look back and I track these numbers closely, uh, my high intensity ramp program after the first few years, I think clients were staying in it, know, around nine months on average. Today, we've had clients in our ramp program for eight years, 10 years, um, and, and they don't want to leave. And, and, and so I don't have to turn on more marketing and sales. I don't have to go burn profits uh, to make money. I don't have to spend money to make money. And, and, and that's really the premise of revenue growth is you're scaling against an asset. And, and I use lots of examples in the book. I talk about, you know, where a salesperson in one case has a $750,000 quota. Well, to generate five to 10 million, I'm going to need 15 to 20 salespeople, as opposed to if, if following these principles, uh, everybody working together, the whole enterprise being leveraged. We help one salesperson sell $13.5 million dollars. Uh, oh my gosh, I just saved eight categories of cost times 10 to 15 people. Uh, that could be several million dollars, which is pure profit. And, and, and so we want to learn how to rev, uh, grow revenue against every asset you have, every product you have, uh, every client, uh, every employee, everything you have, you want to generate more from that existing asset. And when you do that, that's actually how you create wealth. That's how you protect profits. And that's how you generate higher, as you should be, if you're done it right, you're going to generate higher margins and protect your profits. There's a, there's a double uh, way to uh, increase your cash. And, and, and that's what I call creating wealth. And that's the mindset that, that very few people understand. 
they 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 just use they uh, they exchange the words, but they don't understand the principles. And so I'm on this crusade or mission to help people understand. You know what? If you want a, a great success as fast as possible, stop trying to grow your business and learn how to create wealth by generating more from less in the right way. So I mean, it's a it's a modern age business acumen, right? I mean, but even when you start talking about the whole investment. Um, let's just say ecosystem, you know, it is get your funding scale up, right? It's, Hey, I need to add more SDRs and BDRs. Hey, I need to add, you know, I need to add, 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 add. Uh, and that's not the case. Um, you're, you're saying that there needs to be a little bit different approach to that. Well, see, and this is where the nuance of the word scaling means I can add capacity. I can add more people. I can increase my sales head count. I, I can penetrate more markets. Um, that, that is a form of scaling. And what I'm saying is you're scaling against an asset. In, a, in other words, has your store location maximized all the sales possible using the fewest resources? It, it's that gap that actually creates wealth. And so uh, we th- and this is where we just throw those words around and, and, and interchange them. But when we really understand the nuances of the words and, and, and scaling up versus scaling against, are two different concepts. And for those that are listening and want to understand this, and, and here's, here's what's interesting, and, and, and I want to get this point across. You can run a great business by adding. You can add a, uh, run a great business and make money uh, by growing your business faster and getting it bigger. But you know what? At the end of the day, most leaders really don't want a bigger business. They don't want a lot more employees. They don't want a lot more client headaches. They don't want those things. They just take them on And then they absorb it in the toxicity of their organization or they take it on with the stress of their health. What I'm saying is, why not have what you really want? You want not a better organization, but an organization that generates more cash, cash flow, cash on hand, working capital, and you don't have to work any harder to get it. Well, you're saying that's what they want, but then you also talk about leaders being um, a bottleneck. Um, You talk about them, um, you know, being barriers. Um, and roadblocks to success. Well, well, how so if they want these things? Yeah, and uh, over over the two and a half decades I've been doing this inside companies and then running my own company, um, I've identified about 22 what I call change resistance issues. And and there there are so many. And and I share in the book that you're going to hit change resistance issues on the outside and on the inside. Now, most people think that the change resistance issues are the biggest on the outside. Actually, they're on the inside. It, it, it's, and, and I'll give you the greatest one of all. And, and this is what kills most sales careers. And this is what kills most companies being optimized or generating all the profit they could and should is they've had success doing it the old way. And, 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 and if you've, you know, for here's a, here's a cliche, sales is a numbers game. So if it took you 10 calls to get through to make that one sale or, or whatever your ratio is, then you've got to make 20 to get two and you've got to make 40 to get four or so on up the, up the ladder. Um, well, here's the problem. That doesn't, that doesn't scale on any le- of any kind. Um, you, you can only work so hard. You can only manage the efficiency side so hard. You've got to work the effectiveness side. And so the sad part is most leaders might be my age or older or a little younger, they're living off the paradigms from the end of last century coming into this century. And here's the thing, they worked. A lot of these paradigms, spend money to make money or uh, uh, sales is a numbers game or uh, a lot of these cliches, those worked last century. Another example is um, aggressively market and sell your products and services. That was a wonderful paradigm, and it was a best practice in the 1960s. Today, today, if you're aggressively marketing and selling your products and services, you're making so many mistakes, I can't tell you how embarrassing it is. First of all, you've got to learn how to create demand today, and you've got to leverage your whole enterprise doing it. And number three, uh, the marketplace doesn't care about your products and services. They only care about the impact. So you've made three major mistakes right there. And you'll hear people out there, consultants and coaches telling you, well, get out and market or get out and sell your products and services. And I'm saying, wow, there's three major flaws from a dinosaur that you're probably paying to tell you to do it. I'm sorry. 
<laughs> oh, ouch. Well, I think, but, but part of this also, as I mentioned before, is, you know, customer experience being so important. I mean, you know, part of the sales activity, this marketing activity, this retention activity, I mean, it's really, you know, uh, having these organizations work in a way by which uh, they are, as you call, you know, optimized. You worked at a big company. You can say that. <laughs> um, and, and so you, you, have, you have systems and frameworks and you talk about that. So if you can't explain what that is and what it needs to be today for us to be optimized appropriately, uh, because you call it blueprinting optimization. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, uh, and, and that's one of the latter chapters because uh, I, I get uh, clients to come back to me on their second, third companies. I've helped them grow out their first. They've sold retired for a while, got their golf index down to zero and they come back, okay, I'm ready to start again. <laughs> what do we do different this time? And I said, well, we're going to start optimizing. We're going to start blueprinting from the start. And, and what I mean by that is, and, and I've, I've been a chief strategy officer of a billion dollar tech services company. I've done strategic planning on levels that are, you know, it's cost a million dollars to develop certain strategic plans. Um, I've also been trained and certified in organizational design and some very heady concepts. That's not those two. What blueprinting optimization is, is saying, how do we, uh, and not a vision again either, how do we uh, consistently transform the areas of our business to stay ahead of the curve? And, and what I mean by that is um, one of the earlier chapters is what's called an FMP or fundamental marketplace problem. That's the reason for being, and that's the reason to exist or to come into existence. However, literally every FMP evolves, changes, or goes away. And I, and I use four uh, uh, examples of pizza companies and pizza models, how each one came along and said, man, this is a multi-billion dollar growth industry. How do I get my fair share? Well, you don't be me too, because there, there's a lot of me too pizza places that never got anywhere. And you, you see the one or two stores and that's it. But now, how do these others come along and then come out of nowhere and take on the, the Pizza Hut Goliath or the Domino's? How do they come in and just start gobbling market share? Well, they came at the FMP from a different angle. And, and they looked at it and said, wow, okay, so uh, we can attack from this angle and still go after this red ocean market. We're just going to uh, solve the problem differently in the way the market wants it today. And, and what I'm saying is, you have got to build that into your model now forever because FMPs evolve, they go away, uh, they come back in different fashions. It's interesting watching the pizza companies today, what's been the big evolution for pizza companies is they sell other things besides pizza. They, they, they sell spaghetti and pasta and sandwiches uh, because the, the FMP of pizza uh, has been saturated, not just the industry and, and the cheese, but it's been overwhelmed with competition to where, okay, now we've got to evolve. Well, those products are rolling out and who is it? Pizza Hut just rolled out a brand new product. They probably been working on that for five years, 10 years uh, in the uh, fast food industry. And, and I love the fast food. I love the uh, pizza industry. I love these industries where, you, where you're surviving on uh, pennies or even mills of pennies because that's where the brilliance and the great thinking comes from. So it's interesting now that the great thing in the McDonald's, the Burger Kings and those, the chicken wars. I mean, you know, these are burger joints and, and the big thing right now is the chicken wars. They're all coming out with their different kinds of chicken sandwiches. McDonald's has had a chicken sandwich. They're coming out with three new ones. Well, they didn't decide that a year ago or two years ago. They've been mapping this for 10 years and evolving and tracking the market and the focus groups well, most small businesses can't afford uh, that kind of testing and evaluation, but it's no different than my business. I've been working on this book for 18 years, uh, really finally decided three years, to, three years ago to commit to it as I watched the publishing industry evolve. I, I didn't want to bring this out six years ago or eight years ago because the industry was still evolving and it was uh, really in a flux. And, and so um, every business, every business leader and the employees, you've got to be looking at the marketplace problem that you're solving today and start to predict where is it going and how do you evolve before you have to. And, and on one more quick example, and I'll just share with you, there, there are going to be car manufacturers in the next five or 10 years aren't going to make it because they couldn't convert or shift to the electronic engines or the electric engines fast enough. And, and at the same time, you see somebody else comes along, Elon Musk, and says, you know what, uh, why don't I just start with electric cars? Now, here's the crazy thing about it. When, when the automobile industry actually started, they were electric cars. 
but the batteries couldn't last and they wouldn't go very far. So they switched to internal combustion engines. Well, we've done full circle now, 150 years or so later, we've done full circle now where everything's gonna be electric engines and BMW and some of these companies have said, we won't produce uh, internal combustion engines anymore. We're going completely electric. Well, they've been evaluating that five and 10 years uh, to prepare. So I just, I, I press on everybody. And I put that in the chapter because I get the companies to call me. They're 10 million, 50 million, 100 million. Some of these billion dollar companies, they go, wow, we've hit a plateau. We're struggling now and all that. I said, yeah, you, you stopped evolving. You, you, you got happy or you got uh, satisfied and satiated. You got lazy and the market left you. And, and, and now where do you go? And, and, and in many cases, you can't catch up. The retailers, they can't catch up. It's gone. Well, and I think what you're talking about there is, um, a, you know, a lot of people don't see growth uh, in its proper context. So you have growth coming from disruptors, but then you have growth also coming from acquisition. And so a, lo a lot of the growth, when you start looking at it in, in the, the, the business marketplace is, is really, it's debt capitalization. I mean, it's, you know, they're, they're buying other companies and that's how they're, you know, increasing their, their company size. Uh, but I don't want to, you're, you're getting into some really, really deep subjects um, <laughs> and topics here. And I want to make sure that we don't breeze past yes. the critical importance of the FMP. Yeah. So the, because for me, that looking at the FMP, it was like, ah, oh, I mean, it's that constant daily reminder from a client service perspective, from a marketing perspective, from a sales perspective, that I have to always be focusing in on that fundamental marketplace problem. It's not about features and benefits. It's right. not about, you know, a lot of these other things that we often see. It's the FMP. So please explain what that fundamental marketplace product. Yeah. Problem. And and this is one of those things that um, over my years, decades of doing this, I, I, the roads kept leading back. I, I, I typically get the phone call from the CEO for two reasons or the entrepreneur or the business that's saying, hey, we're, we're not growing fast enough to where we should be, or we're growing fast and we want to grow faster. And, and, I, and they call me and, they, and I said, well, what do you think is the problem? And the answer is almost always something in sales or marketing. And it's the sales force and they want to hire more sales management. They want to rotate out their people. They want to uh, train them more. I, some, in most cases, it's torture. And, and, um, and, and I, I come in and take a look. Or I talk to them on the phone. I said, many times I could just look at their website. And I said, but sales marketing is not your problem. That, that's not the root cause. That's a symptom. And, 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 and it's why that I want to throw some statistics out that are just amazing that, that, that we found over time. 67% of sales and marketing um, uh, costs and expenses are total waste of resources and time. Uh, two thirds. And, and I'm, a, I'm actually going to say this. I'll say that I rarely say this. The number is closer to 80 percent, but that's so high. Nobody would believe it. But, but I have the stats and the figures and, and the reasons to support that. But two-thirds, so if, if you're in a business right now, you're running a business, I, I can walk in your business and pretty much guarantee you two-thirds of what you're doing or spending on sales and marketing is not going anywhere. Matter of fact, it might even be damaging your brand, okay? And, 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 and why is that? Well, it's not because of social media platforms and digital marketing, and you might even be doing physical or traditional advertising. There's three forms of, of marketing. The, the problem is you're not connecting with why anyone should care. The, your, your, your whole um, reason for being is not anchored or tethered to something that people really care about. You're offering what somebody else is or you're doing what someone else is. And so now you make the buyer try to make a choice. Well, OK, you look good. But I think uh, as a buyer, I think I'll go with lowest price or biggest brand which are usually the two worst reasons to ever buy something. But as a buyer, it's like, I don't know any better. You all sound alike. You all say the same thing. And so I'm just going to default to, to safety. Either it's low price, and I save money and I pay the risk, or I go with the big brand and I got somebody I can sue if it fails. That, that's the mentality. And we let them do that. And so um, what I'm saying is uh, you've got to start back with the beginning. If you truly want to optimize, and let's create all the wealth that's possible in your business using the resources you have. You have to go back and say, um, what is the problem my business is solving? And, and I'll, I'll use my own personal example because I, I think it's so important uh, for, for experts that are call themselves experts to eat their own dog food. And that's one of the tests when you're hiring an expert. Say, well, how do you do this in your business? How have you used this? So when I started my uh, business transformation uh, firm 2002, around that area, 
I looked around, I said, what's the biggest problem? What's the fundamental marketplace problem uh, with consulting, coaching, training services? And the number one issue is nine out of 10 consulting, training, coaching efforts or projects fail. They, 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 don't, they don't move the ball forward. They don't provide a return. Uh, there's no uh, sustainable transformation. They fail. Well, what's the reason for that? What's root cause? Root cause accountability and implementation. And, and, and the way the big consulting firms make their fortune is they, they lowball to get in and look around at what you're doing. And then they hit you with these amazing hundred thousand quarter million, million dollar fees to help you go implement. And, and the people are like, oh, gosh, I can't afford that. I'm a, or I'm a, you know, I'm five million or $10 million business. I don't have a quarter of a million dollars to do the implementation. And, and so I, I came along and when I built my model, I said, I'm going to solve that with my model you're not going to pay me a quarter of a million dollars. What we're going to do is we're going to work month by month and, and, and under no contract. And, and you're going to pay a small fraction of that number. If you like to work, we keep working together. And if you pay, if you don't pay, I, I don't come back. Uh, but, but we'll work together and I'll, I'll do it over time. But I will be inside your shop and I will hold you accountable and I will do the implementation. I'll bring you the templates and tools. I will actually give you my intellectual property. If you're in my program, I will give you my tools. I'll give you my black box. My consultant friend said, oh, no, never, ever do that. I said, yeah, but that solves their problem. And they told me, well, that's not, you'll, you'll not make a lot of money that way. You'll you lose your clients. Just the opposite happened. People kept coming back or they never left. Because I'd say, no, I'm going to help them. I'm going to help them with the fundamental marketplace problem. And that is they can't get it implemented. They can't get through the change resistance issues. And I've been doing this for years and I've got the strategies to get through. Them. But to go back and explain what is a fundamental marketplace problem. It's something in the marketplace uh, that is either broken or is underserved or is an opportunity. And, wh and what that means is um, there's something out there. Well, you know what? Let me give you a story because I think this is a great story and, and how it turned out. So uh, uh, I had a workshop uh, and, and uh, this lady came up to me. She goes, I'm marketing officer of this. I'm chief marketing officer of this company. And um, here's what we do. And I said, okay, great. She said, I, I've got to have you meet my CEO and, and the team because what you're talking about is exactly what we want. We, we, we need guidance on how do we grow and scale and make money from this thing. So I go into their offices and I meet the owner. His name was Ben. And, and I said, Ben, tell me what's going on here. And, and then he shared. He goes, Ken, I was down in Houston. And um, it was Friday evening. And uh, my son had their championship soccer game. And I, and I left the meeting. I'm in a rental car. And I get to one of the toll booths. And this is uh, I'm trying to think of 12 years back, 10 years, 12 years back. And uh, he goes, I, um, I was forced over into the cash lane and there was a really long line. And um, I can't remember if he didn't have enough cash or he didn't have a check or whatever, but he got stalled there and the line just moved like snails. And he goes, Kent, I missed my plane. And, and, and my son cried that I didn't make his championship game. And he said, he goes, he said he was just so distraught of, of being trying to be that great dad and earn a living, but, but because he couldn't get through the toll booth. And he goes, I, I, I'm leaving Microsoft, my company, and I formed this team. We are going to solve the problem of why can't rental cars get through toll booths without stopping and having to pay or write a check or give a credit card. And he formed a company called Rent-A-Toll. And uh, he shared that story with me, and I said, beautiful. You, I said, you are so spot on. And so we talked to it, we worked through it, we built out the models and all that stuff. And uh, this is one of those cases where it was so powerful because um, not only did he get it and, and, and Deb, who was the uh, CMO, but uh, Ben told the rest of the team, he goes, we've been trying all different ways to grow and scale this thing and make this thing happen. Uh, we're going to follow Kent's way. We're, we're all doing it his way, but we're going to try it. And, and we're going to get on this path of learning and understanding revenue growth versus just trying to grow this thing. And, and that's the path. And we're committed to it. And if you're not on board, you can, you can leave now. And, and I have to tell you, I left that meeting that day and I said, that's, that's my perfect client profile it, is they, they understand where I'm coming from. They heard me speak at a workshop. They listened to my material. They bought in my philosophies. And they said, we're committed to this path. We're going to try it and see where it goes. Well, they were pre-revenue. I, th I thought they had somebody, but I found out later, Deb told me they were pre-revenue. And, and just a few years later, they sold for 12 to $15 million by solving a fundamental marketplace problem that there was no technology to get rental cars through uh, the toll booths. And, and um, so the point there is that there are, there are FMPs all over. There are more FMPs, fundamental marketplace problems today than ever. 
the trick is, and what I share in the chapter is, how do you frame it? it is it a problem that has any scope and scale? Uh, is, it a, is it a want or a need? Will, will people pay you for it to fix it? Uh, or is it an irritant? Uh, you, you've got to work through that uh, process. And then the next step, the next chapter is, so how do I build a unique model to solve it differently than anybody else? And then the third chapter after that is, and how do I make money doing it? But that FMP is the cornerstone. And, and here's the point, and, and I, I want to press this with your listeners, is you have to go back and look, oh, every one to two few years and anchor back and say, is that still what's most broken today? Or are there 100 competitors doing it? And do we have to pivot to a different way to solve it? And, 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 and so um, your FMP is kind of, if you, if you think of uh, the, you, the, the entrepreneur has the seed and the idea, you got to think of the FMP as the soil. It takes both the soil and the seed and then the nurturing to bring it to life and grow and scale it. And so um, I hope that's a good definition and example of story of what an FMP is. And that's where you anchor and then start to unlock uh, the revenue and, and sales and profit potential um, because you have a serious reason for being that people want to understand. And that then ripples into your value proposition, your model that helps answer a thousand questions in growing and scaling a business. Well, in addition to what you're saying is, is that, you know, FMP is being revealed by your existing customers every day. And this is one of the things that we talk about coming from the contact center world is, is, you know, we have all these interactions that are happening and, and, and these days they're not the simple ones. They're the complex yeah. ones because the simple uh -huh. ones are being washed away, you know, and those FMPs are part of, your value proposition. And the unfortunate problem is, is that most organizations just see it as a process. And, and uh, you'll hear it all the time with people on the front line. They'll say, oh, yeah, we've been taking and fixing those problems for the past couple of years. Why? <laughs> Why are you still fixing the same things from yeah. two years ago? That should have been a product. It should have been, you know, an opportunity for you to get more revenue share and deeper you know, yeah. pocket. I mean, it, there's all kinds of things that we're just missing opportunities on. And I think that's part of what you're talking about as well. And let me add one more thing to that, because I, again, it's so important. I eat my own dog food. The, the, the first few years in my business, it was, it was fast growth. Everybody wanted fast growth. They were good times. Right. Um, but then we had the, the, you know, that was that post tech wreck. And then we had the 2007, eight uh, financial crisis. Now the COVID crisis, there's a different FMP today. It, it's not, not uh, I want to do more and I want to spend more. It's I got to do more and I don't have any money. And, 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 and so the premise of the book and my timing was to try to meet the market where it is today to say, look, I, I want to help you make money and not spend any because that because the FMP is different today. So many companies, they don't have any money. They're, they're running on fumes and these, these government stimulus checks can only go so far. And, and now business owners and leaders and employees are saying, oh my God, I, I've still got to uh, generate business. I've got to bring in clients. I've got to make money, but I don't have a dollar and I don't have an hour and I don't have, I can't bring on more headcount to do it. So, so that, that FMP has evolved and, and this is where I'm trying to meet it with my product or my book, my roadmap to help people understand that. And, that, and that's the evolution. And my, my prediction is that that will be the future, that you, as a leader, if you don't understand that, that process of more from less in the right way, not grinding people and, and burning out relationships, but more from less in a scalable way. And if you don't learn how to make money without spending money, uh, your job or role as a leader might come to an end. Uh, okay. So I think it's also important to clarify because for me, I needed it too. Cause, cause oftentimes, especially the world that I come from, they talk about doing more with less. Yeah. So what is the difference between doing more with less and getting more from less? Yeah. The, you know, and I have to hear how someone would actually say it in a sentence because arguably you could say the same thing. What I want people to learn the way I'm saying more from less and, and I actually want to rewind a little bit because We've been using more from less in the bad times. The times are tough right now. I, I was through the, the SNL crisis. I went through the, in the 90s. We had some crisis, uh, financial constraints. Um, that was more from less where I was trying to squeeze more out of an employee. I was trying to work them harder. I gave them two jobs instead of one. Um, I, uh, I slow paid my vendors. I, I, in other words, we, we were doing all these things to get more out, out of, out of, out of uh, less uh, uh, our assets. What I'm 
trying to share with people is I want you to learn how to scale against an asset. So in other words, it, it, the example I used earlier of a salesperson selling 13 and a half million versus just meeting their quota and I'm having to hire 10 more. Well, this salesperson didn't have to work any harder. They didn't have to call on more accounts. Uh, they, they didn't have to make more calls. Matter of fact, what I did is I created the system, the whole enterprise around them to help them. And, and I'll give you a great example of that. When I say sales and marketing model is a throwback to the 1960s, what I'm saying today is every organization in your enterprise should be uh, responsible for helping create demand. Marketing, and some people do sales, but I, I like to see marketing be accountable. In, in other words, if we should be generating leads from different parts of our organization, support, delivery, and sales, and marketing, and from strategic partners, we should be generating uh, demand and leads from all the sources. And then uh, marketing is the clearinghouse and accountable to make the number that the company needs. We'll see that that's that's so anti the departmental model or the silo model that we're all under today. And I walk into groups today and I they have people, they have salespeople in complex sales. Now complex sales is different. There's two sales environments, simple sales and complex sales. So complex sales, you're working three, six, nine, maybe 12 months on a particular opportunity. And you can only really manage two or three or four of those, depending on, on the complexity of the cycle or the, or the type of, if it's government versus business. And then the company wants the salesperson to be generating leads. And, and matter of fact, I've been there back in my early career. It's like, well, we want you managing these amazing complex sales with all these moving parts. They're more complex than ever. And sometimes like government, there's actually two sales cycles. You gotta, you gotta make the a vendor approval list before then you can go start the sales cycle. And, and I'm, I'm sitting here going, well, first of all, you want to know why you can't get more salespeople or the ones you've got are leaving because they can't do that job. There, there, there's no way you can work complex sales and do them properly and have high win rates. I had 70, 80 percent win rates for years um, because I said, I'm, I'm not going to generate more leads. I'm going to go close the business we have uh, and not take the risk. Now, I could generate some, but I, I didn't spend so many hours a day because you have to you have to bring home what what you owe. And, and, and so what I'm saying is. I need every part of the organization to help create demand and then help convert it. Now, I got to add this caveat because I've just I've fired my last three HVAC companies because of this. I'm not saying everyone in your organization should sell. And, and one of my last HVAC companies who I really liked on the way out, uh, the engineer, the, the service technician, you know, we give them all these titles. The service technician turned to me and wanted to walk through their, their uh, maintenance program. And he had it all laid out. He had practiced his spiel and all this. It, it was so icky and awkward for me and him. And I, I just said, thank you. I think you're a good service technician. Stay out of sales. And, and he kind of turned his head at me and realized that was really a yucky situation. Because what they were doing was the, they were saying, okay, now you're a service technician and we want you to be a salesperson. What a conflict of interest. What, what an amazing conflict of interest. When, when, when I'm struggling to trust these HVAC guys uh, on their own, and now they're asking them to be salespeople too, uh, I, get, I get that you're a small business, but follow my book and you don't have to have your service technicians be salespeople because it's icky and sleazy, cheesy, and greasy. Anyway, I, that, and, and I'm mad because I, had, I just couldn't take those guys coming in and making a sales call every time they were doing maintenance or fixing something. I, I just said, I, I don't need this. I don't want this. And so my point being is, I don't want anybody, everybody in your organization selling. We, we don't need more salespeople. We don't need more sales calls uh, or sales presentations. What we need are more problem solvers. We need people to be more entrepreneurial um, and, and, and work to put the client first and help the client solve their problems. So my, I'm back to, but you do need every part of your organization creating demand and you need every part of your organization helping support converting demand into new clients, cash and contracts. So I hope I'm real clear on that because I hear people are well, well, you know, I need my salespeople generating leads. Well, maybe in simple sales or transaction sales, they have the time and can, but if they're in complex sales, you need your whole enterprise. And if you don't, you will never come close to optimizing the growth, sales, revenue, and profit potential of your company. Yeah, I, I mean, to me, when you're talking about that, I start thinking about uh, the level of, of maturity and sophistication of the way that the development end of that is put together. So for example, in customer service, if you are going to solve a customer's problems, that may involve some selling activities, right? It just may. Um, 
Well, I, I, I prefer to say I, it, it provides some leadership opportunities. In other words, let me, let me walk you through the different ways you can solve this without us or doing it on your own, or if you hired another company or if you chose us, let me share with you all your options and choices. Selling is when I'm the option and you need to buy it from me. That, that, that's where I struggle. And I, and I don't like uh, the, the language of, well, you need to be consultative in your selling. Well, I don't know what that means because in most cases that's hijacked. It's a, it's a perverse way of using language to still be manipulative. And I probably, <laughs> just offended, I probably just offended a lot of people, but you know what? I've been doing this for 40 years and, and I, know, I know the right and the wrong. But, but here's what's interesting. All, all buyers are thirsty for leadership. What are my options and choices if I don't use you? Where could I go? How would I do it? So many times I'll, I'll turn to people. And here's my comment, con contractors and, and people. I'll just say, I understand it's broken. I understand you can fix it. What would you do? If it was your money, what would you do? How would you fix it? And, and I have this conversation with my car dealers all the time. I'm taking my car back in and, you know, something's happened. If one of the cars is out of warranty now. And I go, how would you fix this? And it's interesting how eight out of 10 times they go, well, what I'd really do is, or I wouldn't do that part now, I'd do this part, but only because I ask them. And then I'm sitting back going, well, that wasn't the leadership I was looking for. You were selling me versus leading me. And, and, and people don't like being sold and we don't need more salespeople out there. Well, and that's exactly what I'm talking about. So it's the right mindset, the right approach. It's the right, you know, I mean, you know, doing in a manner by which it actually elevates the trust. I mean, all of those things are critically important. And then, and then you're right. That is what people look for. And, and it, the simple way is being low skill, uh, just being very responsive and reading the script and saying, oh, they've got this problem. You need to sell them this, 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 and this. That's, that's where you have some issues. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I think the leadership is a very important word now. Okay. So when we start talking about the, the process and you mentioned how important it is to, you know, be sequential in this is, um, to be highly profitable and growth. You talk about breaking it into four phases, revenue ready, market ready, go to market ready, and then own the market. And we've had a conversation that really has hit all of those. I'm not going to break those down at this point because yeah. we've had a great discussion and people need to read the book. Matter of fact, um, you and I need to talk about you coming back on the show because um, the, the depth of what you're going into is so valuable in so many ways that we need to explore some of this a little bit right. further. But I want to go into one of the core pillars in all of this, and we've kind of hit on it on a little bit, and I want to be a little bit more succinct before, you know, we, we move on to our hump day hoedown, and that is you need people. You need people to be able to um, have the success that is sustainable. You know, we may be able to do some things in the short run, um, but in order to be successful in the long run, and you even talked about burnout and this, any other, we have to have people to do it. You know, now we talked about optimization. I've heard other experts talk about you know, hey, you don't, you shouldn't talk about people and human capital or, you know, people or teens and this, that, and the other with optimized because nobody wants to be optimized. You know, it's something that's um, not, you know, very, very people friendly, but you do talk about talent optimization. So what is talent optimization? Yeah. And so let me go back to your first comment. And uh, if you need people or you need employees, that's, that's one line of thinking. And what I'm saying is you need talent at all levels. And, and, and as you take on uh, you, you scale in different ways or expand or whatever you do, you're going to need talent in, in uh, different areas and at all levels. So I, I'm, uh, I'm huge on talent um, and, and, and I really explain how to, uh, the definition and, and the measurement of what talent is versus a normal employee. Now, here's what's interesting is something uh, that's unique about talent versus a regular employee is um, Talents and, and, and to help people is every company, whether you got two or three people in your company, you can think of somebody that's just, wow, they're able to get things done and they just make it look easier. They just, they're able to get it. How, how do they do that? And, and that's, that's thinking along those lines of what a talent is. And so a talent, one of the misguided, misguided uh, definitions of talent is they're a maverick, they're out there on their own, they don't fit in, they're... Uh, we see this in sports a lot. We see that prima donna that has to always take the shot or they have to have the ball or it's all about them. That's not a talent. That's a turkey. When, when, when you have an individual that puts themselves above the company and above the team, you, you don't want them. Get rid of them as fast as you can or don't ever hire them. And I talk about putting in an acclimation program so you can uncover or discover that if you miss it in the interviewing process. 
that you want those people, super talents that could just, they're amazing at getting things done and they want to work within a team construct and they want to be part of a system. And they do want to be optimized. They, they, they do want to have their talents and their skills stretched and pulled and, and they want to be challenged and, and they want to be put in front of amazingly difficult tasks. They actually welcome those things. So, so when we say, well, people don't want to be optimized. No, what they don't want to do is they don't want to be uh, ground out. They don't want to be over leveraged. They don't want to be underappreciated. They don't want to be put in um, bad systems. They don't want to be put in awkward situations where they have no control. Uh, they want to be put in systems where they can flourish, where, where they can grow and they can excel and, and they can really show uh, what they're made of and what, what their worth is possible. And, and, and it's so interesting, and I share this all the time because I get a, not a lot of pushback, but people struggle with this concept. And they say, well, I don't, you know, I don't want a marketing team or sales team filled with talent. And I said, why not? Well, you know, we need everybody to get along and all that. I said, well, that's not talent then. Uh, talent will work in a team construct, and they want to be part of a great team, um, and, and they want to help the team be better. Uh, and, and so it's also interesting because the other day I heard uh, – Somebody in one of my CEO groups there said, oh, my God, I just can't find people right now. And I said, no, you don't know how to attract people. You haven't created the system that talent wants to come work for you because they're thinking, well, there's just not a lot of people available right now. And I said, well, talent is never available. So, so don't think that because of the bad times, all of a sudden now talent's available. Talent always has a home. Talent always has a job. And, and, and so you have to go uh, either pick them off or steal them, or you've got to attract them because they're just not going to come on their own. They're not on the, the, the job boards. I mean, I think there was a reason they called it monster.com. I mean, the, the people that were out there, they didn't have a home. They didn't have a job. And they're, they're trying to come over and, and, and scare up your place. Uh, instead, what you want is, is you've got to understand, well, who is talent? I, and I'll give you a great example of this. When I built out the, uh, the software from the last public corporation I worked for, and I was building out this software sales organization. Now, I use recruiters. I used all kinds of strategies to both attract and, and engage and then uh, convert people over to my team. Uh, the first conversation I had with one of the recruiting services is I said, uh, here are my five main competitors, and two of them, I know they're top sales talent. I need you to find the other three, and then your job is to get me meetings with those people because I, I'm going to go pick them off, and I'm going to go hire away their top sales talent and, and, and it was so interesting that the, the recruiter was like, well, gosh, you know, we've never really worked that way. We just kind of, I said, no, just give me their names and give me their phone number. I'll call out, I'll call them and go find them and I'll meet with them and I'll hire them. And I will pay you your commission, your 20, 25%, but you go find them and get me connected or I'll connect. And then I will bring them over. And I, I what out of 18, 19 job offers, 17 accepted over a three-year period. And then they were the best. They were the best from BMC, CA, Tivoli, HP, B, uh, IBM. These were, the, these were the best of the best companies. And I, and I was picking them off because I had the system that would allow them to flourish. I had the system that if they were making three or 400,000, I said, how would you like to double or triple that and not work any harder? How would you like to never make a sales call again? How would you like to? And they're like, wow, what? tell me about your system. How, do you, how does this work? And I said, let me lay it out. Here's my model. Here's how I put it all together. Because my whole design and my system is to make you so successful, you're embarrassed. But, but here's the rule. The rule is the company has to get paid first. The company has to generate the revenues and the profits. Then you get paid. And, and the company and the team has to come above you. The company first, team second, you're third. If, if you get that out of alignment, we'll have one conversation and never another one. And so I ran a public software sales organization. I think at max, I was at 18 people at one time. In three years, in an industry that has 40% average turnover, I had zero unplanned turnover, 5% planned in a public software company. We had a 96% win rate. We won 48 out of 50 major contracts in three years. We, we dominated the marketplace. We, 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 there, were, there were bids where once one of the competitors heard that we were bidding or we were going to give a presentation, they didn't show up. Because, it, and it's what I'm talking about in those last three chapters of dominating uh, or owning a marketplace. And it's all about talent. It's all about own, knowing your competitors better than you know yourself and that constant blueprinting optimization. When, when you wire those together sequentially, uh, you can start to attack markets. We have clients today that you know, had 20% win rates when we walked through the door. 
And then a year later, they have 80% win rates. And, and, and the, one, the one I'm the CEO, he says, you know, Kent, and we stopped discounting. We stopped lowering our prices and we're winning four times as much. And I said, isn't that a beautiful thing? And he said, it's amazing. And our contracts are getting bigger. And I said, now you are experiencing uh, optimizing revenue growth. Your contracts are bigger, they're better, they're higher margin, and you win them faster and you lose less often. That's optimization. Okay. So now, gosh, again, uh, so many nuggets. And I want a lot of people to pay attention because what Kent just went through and explained and talked about that story is, hey, he gave people some high expectations. He gave people, uh, you know, a very, very clear understanding of what, you know, will and will not be tolerated. And some people say, well, gosh, that's harsh. But look at the performance. And do you think if his people were totally miserable that they would stay and he would have that type of turnover? The answer is absolutely not. So I think there's a lot of lessons there that people necessarily caught talking about the, the traditional path and what people do, they just don't do. Now, Kent, um, we have talked a lot about some you know, really good things. And a lot of times we talk about times where we've gotten over the hump. And I think you've really just shared all those throughout our time together. Um, and we talk about things that inspire us. You've hit those as well. I really, before we move into the hump day hoedown, I want to get an understanding of, you know, what is one goal that Kent Billingsley has that he's willing to share? Yeah, and I said at the very last of my book, and, and, and I have a vision and a mission. I want to help a million entrepreneurs, and this includes employees, become millionaires. I, I want to help them put seven figures in the bank and, and not, not gaudy millionaires and not that they're, you know, if they want to drive fancy sports cars and mega mansions, that's, that's fine. But, but if I can help a million entrepreneurs um, put money in the bank to get them through the really tough times and to have security to where they're not stressed out and, 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 and dealing with money problems. And, and I want to give you another statistic that's just absolutely frightening. 98% of uh, businesses and entrepreneurs uh, have cash problems. They struggle with uh, cash on hand, inconsistent cash flow, um, almost no working capital, lagging receivables. I mean, they just have all kinds of problems. That was pre-COVID. That was before the pandemic. And, and now all of a sudden this pandemic's come through and because they had cash problems before, I hear somebody saying, oh, this pandemic's wiping companies out. No, they, they, they were struggling before. The, the pandemic's just been the symptoms that just is, is taking them out for good. And, and even in our own neighborhood, we've lost uh, some good restaurants. And I know that meant the employees, the vendors, the suppliers. Um, we've lost some companies. I see the, the, the for lease on their, their signs now. And, and those were great products and services that that will maybe never come back. And I'm, I'm just heartbroken. And, and so what I'm saying is I, I really want to help a lot of people, maybe more, I, I hope, maybe more than a million. I hope I can uh, to, to get paid the true worth and value of, of what you bring to the marketplace and turn that into money so that you can be around and you can start that second, third business and you can solve that next fundamental marketplace problem. And you can, you can help make the world better because I, and I had a, a, a tweet that went out the other day and I said, we actually don't need more entrepreneurs. We need more people that are entrepreneurial solving tough, complex problems with the resources we have. And, and so that's my mission. And, um, uh, you know, and helping co- get in companies and helping them that, that they buy in these philosophies, they get their team on board and they, they start to follow this roadmap of, of delivering greater value and being paid the, the, the worth of that value that they're delivering. And we, we, when we can do that, we're really going to generate uh, uh, one other real quick point. America used to be known as the entrepreneurial hotspot in the world. I think we're number nine now. There, there are countries, I mean, like Israel and, and Singapore and, and even Ireland. I'm going to do an interview with Ireland, a business thing in Ireland next week. Uh, there are so many countries out there that are becoming so much more entrepreneurial. And, and I'm just looking back on, my gosh, that there is no reason for that. We're, we're just living in last century and, and waiting for things to get better or go back to the way they were. They're not. You've got to get on a different map, a path, get, get off this growing my business path and get on this. How do I create wealth? How to deliver great value uh, and, and use the fewest resources doing it and turn that into cash clients and contracts so you can reinvest and, and, and reward your employees. The other point, one, one other real quick point is I took pride in helping a lot of my people that work for me make over a million dollars a year. And, 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 you know, they, ne- they didn't retire. They actually worked harder. The more money they made, <laughs> the harder they worked. And, and that's the thing I want for you is I want the, the audience out there. If you're working for a company, I want you to, you know, take my book to your CEO and say, hey, here's a way for us to make a lot more money and not spend more money doing it. 
And if you're the leader of a company, go to your team and say, you know what, let's get on this roadmap to where we're all working together to optimize our growth and bring more value to the marketplace. So uh, a long-winded answer, if we can help a million people uh, become millionaires, put seven figures in the bank, we've done a good thing. And the Fast Leader Legion wishes you the very best. Now, before we move on, let's get a quick word from our sponsor. An even better place to work is an easy to use solution that gives you a continuous diagnostic on employee engagement along with integrated activities that will improve employee engagement and leadership skills in everyone. Using this award-winning solution is guaranteed to create motivated, productive, and loyal employees who have great work relationships with their colleagues and your customers. To learn more about an even better place to work, visit beyondmorale.com forward slash better. All right, here we go, Fast Leader Legion. It's time for the Home Day Hoedown. Okay, Kent. The Hump Day Hoedown is a part of our show where you give us good insights fast. So I'm going to ask you several questions, and your okay. job is to give us a robust yet rapid responses that are going to help us move onward and upward faster. Kent Billingsley, are you ready to hold down? Let's do it. All right. So what is holding you back from being an even better leader today? Oh, well, um, um, <laughs> being a better leader. I think uh, uh, continuing to craft my message, my making my value proposition clearer and clearer and connecting. I, I, I'm in the education business and it's hard educating and changing people. The more I can get, the more message I can get out there, the faster I can get this change going. And what is the best leadership advice you have ever received? Yeah, uh, and I work for Ross Perot Sr., uh, the greatest leader I've ever known in my life and, and just beyond inspirational. Um, I, I think the greatest is create, create the system where your people can be successful. Too many times we're told to lead your people, lead their heart, not their head, where, all this stuff. Uh, at the end of the day, your job is create a system where your talent can be wildly successful and get out of their way. And what is one tool that you believe helps you in business or life? Uh, advice that somebody's given me for, for life. Uh, one tool that you believe helps you either, either uh, yeah, in business or a, a, a complex problem solving. I, I, okay. I think I have a, 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 a developed a, a gift or a competency to, to frame very complex problems and define a, a strategies and solutions to, to solve them. And what would be one book you'd recommend to our legion? It could be from any genre. Of course, we're going to put a link to entrepreneur to millionaire on your show notes page yeah. as well. I, I, you know, it's interesting. I wrote this book because I think of the book I read in eighth grade was um, Think and Grow Rich and How to Rent, Win Friends and Influence People. I think those are those are two foundational books that as I was writing, I was saying, what what's a book I can write that um, I hope will be around 25, 50 years and, and, and not age because I try to use frameworks and philosophies versus uh, hot topics. Okay, Fast Leader Legion, you can find links to that and other bonus information on today's show by going to fastleader.net and searching for Kent Billingsley, or just Kent, and you'll be able to find him. Okay, Kent, this is my last hump day hold on question. Yeah. Imagine you've been given the opportunity to go back to the age of 25, and you can take the knowledge and skills that you have now back with you, but you can't take it all. You can only take one. So what skill or piece of knowledge would you take back with you and why? Being entrepreneurial. Being entrepreneurial and, and understanding what that really means and, and uh, not being an entrepreneur, but being entrepreneurial, because that, that will guide you through the company you're in, that will guide you through the problems you're facing, and that will help you be a greater leader. Kent, I had fun with you today. How can the Fast Leader Legion connect with you? Uh, yeah, go to the website. I've got blogs out there. I've just launched a YouTube channel. I've got a few videos out there. Um, Read, comment, share, give me feedback on what you're looking for. Tell me about the challenges. Uh, read my book, leave a review, tell, tell people what you've learned. Help me educate people out there and get them on this roadmap to uh, creating business wealth. Kent Billingsley, thank you for sharing your knowledge and wisdom and the Fast Leader Legion honors you and thanks you for helping us get over the hump. Thank you for joining me on the Fast Leader Show today. For recaps, links from every show, special offers, and access to download and subscribe, if you haven't already, head on over to fastleader.net so we can help you move onward and upward faster. 